Hi, everyone. I'm Vern McCandlish. I'm an incident responder here at Dragos. Welcome to today's webinar where we're going to cover OT incident response being different. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items for today. This session is being recorded and a recording will be sent out after the webinar. All of your lines have been muted, but we still want you to interact with us. So please use the Q&A chat to submit any questions you have throughout. And if you're unable to get to your questions during the webinar, we will follow up with that afterwards. Uh, so to start, uh, again, my name is Vernon McCandlish. I'm a principal industrial incident responder here at Dragos. I'm based here in the United States. I have over 20 years experience, a former law enforcement, uh, building out OT incident response plans, uh, SOCs and incident response systems for OT environments uh, around the world. Now that's for doing just that OT incident response for over 13 years. And my co-host today is Hussein Varani. Thanks, Vern. Hi, as Vern mentioned, I'm Hussein Varani. I'm a senior industrial incident responder. I'm based up in Calgary, Canada. And besides law enforcement and investigations, the main footing that I happen to reside in happens to be in the oil and gas sector. As part of that, I've been an investigator and a forensic analyst. So today we're gonna to start on a three-part series on OTIR. So we've already run one webinar, which is along the lines of, you're not alone when it comes to OT incident response. Uh, we covered the five critical controls for um, an operational technology cybersecurity program. And of course, getting things established from the viewpoint of incident response planning. So for today's webinar, we're gonna talk about the differences between OT and um, ITIR and how it's different. And so we'll draw the differences. We'll speak a bit about some case studies and such. And then of course, always look forward to the third webinar, which is how to be properly prepared in order to respond to an incident in an effective manner. So we'll talk about how to make sure that your people, processes, technology, et cetera, are stack correctly in order to defeat the threat. So quick recap of the first webinar. If you haven't seen it, I recommend that you do uh, because of course it's a three-part series. And so our panelists, um, Tim Ennis and Jan Off went into what exactly the risk profile is for ICS slash OT environments why it's really important to have an established OT specific incident response plan. And they also spoke about the five critical controls for OT cybersecurity. And most importantly, consequence driven incident response, because, and we'll go into this in, in, in a little bit, but there are competing priorities when you look at an IT plan versus an OT plan. So from those five critical controls, the first one is to have the capability of doing incident response in your OT environment. So we're gonna talk about a framework here for incident command and management. Because when an incident happens, we wanna make sure that you have the ability to respond. We all want to prevent all the incidents. And if we had 100% prevention, we wouldn't need response. But the reality is we're never going to be able to get to 100% prevention because the adversaries are creative. They will adapt and overcome some of the defenses that we build and the procedures that we, we put in place. So we have to be prepared to respond well so that we can very quickly regain control of our systems and eject those adversaries from our systems. Because we are worried, or not worried about, the things that we are concerned about is the loss of control for things like electrical geared systems, water systems, the safety systems. Uh, that actually gets to the human safety element of a lot of these uh, OT environments, the systems that we're talking about, well, if they, if we lose control of them, if the owner loses control of them, it would actually put the humans that are the operators in the environment at a safety risk. This can also put the environment at risk for environmental damage. If you have a spill or you have an explosion, these are all the types of things that at just a normal plant disruption can still be millions of dollars a day, depending upon what vertical a plant operation is in. But we really wanna hit on the impacts uh, from these cybersecurity incidents. And that's different from IT. 
an IT, and the joke I have is nobody's ever worried about the printer blowing up during an IT incident. I, I don't mean to to be you know very you know lighthearted with that. IT incident response can actually have an impact on OT, but that IT incident itself rarely has the opportunity for a human safety issue or for environmental damage, even if it can actually have a high dollar consequence uh, just because of the way it's deployed. Yep, and just to add to Vern's point, um, between OT and IT, we have competing interests. From the IT viewpoint, generally speaking, confidentiality is valued. From the OT standpoint, availability is valued. And further to that, absolutely, we're both fairly light-hearted gentlemen. Uh, and of course, we joke about stuff happening in an IT environment not really being impactful. But with an OT environment, there is a clear and present danger to public safety where you start to talk about um, having to do emergency evacuations and, and the like. But most importantly, out of everything is that there is the environmental, the regulatory, the legal aspects that when you have an incident in the IT environment, it is still severe. It is still appreciated that this is something that we need to pay attention to. But from the OT environment, it is um, the services and the availability that actually genuinely impacts the well-being and the convenience of human beings. Back over and the last, and the last point I'll hit on uh, is the 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 really big difference for me as somebody who's been doing this a long time is that I still see a lot of that old legacy technology in OT, where a lot of the IT environments they have a two to three year rollover for their technology. I know that there are always old systems and environments, but the bulk of the IT systems are getting updated on a regular basis, and I still keep track of the last time I found Windows ninety eight while I was doing an incident response. Uh, so we are talking about some some very old old technologies. So when we talk about the the impact, uh, we want to particularly when we are talking about OT environments, we are talking about things like the Trisis incident, where an attacker was ab absolutely testing their code in a in one of uh, victims' environment, and it was causing the safety instrumented system to go offline. Now safety instrumented systems are designed to protect the people in the plant and the people around that plant from any danger because the safety instrumented system, it was the safety valve, it will kick in and stop. It will remove the energy from a system in a manner that's consistent so that it reduces damage and you know, reduces risk of loss of life, injury, or damage to the environment. They were actually attacking that particular system. You have crash override where they were leaving the systems in such a state so that when operators were showing up, if they weren't extremely careful, they could have been. They would have been exposed to to other physical risk. So you're seeing that they really are the the adversaries that we are seeing are either unaware of the dangers that they are posing, or they are completely disregarding, or that may even be one of their objectives to try to get the site in a position where human safety and environmental safety becomes an issue. Yeah, and just to add to Vern's point, we typically see three different kinds of threat actors or threat groups. We see the ones that simply are in the environment and don't understand why they're there or what they're doing. Then we have ones that are just there to kind of, you know, tinker and learn. And that's probably because they don't have a network that's as optimized or an environment as optimized as they want to be. And so that is exfiltration of trade secrets and the like. And then we have the ones that are focused specifically on ICS where the threat group has demonstrated on a consistent basis that they absolutely know what they're doing. So these are folks that can interact with the PLC. They understand ladder logic and they understand how to operate in an ICS environment. And for the loss of production, the ransomware authors, not the authors, but the actual actors that use ransomware to try to coerce payments out of organizations, you know, they discovered a long time ago that the actual dollar value for loss of production is so high that they can demand super high ransoms and it still be smaller than the loss of production that an organization, so they would consider paying. We're not gonna get into whether you should pay or shouldn't pay today. That's a conversation that's individual to each organization. But understanding that that loss of production has such a high dollar value on it that just that alone allows a financial motive behind some of the actors that are deploying ransomware. Yeah, and Vert hit a really important point. 
when threat groups are in the network and they're surveying and they're doing um, lateral movement and enumerating the environment, you'll start to find that their demands tend to be tailored to whatever industry vertical it happens to be. And so there's a few examples on the screen right now, and I'll touch on two. Um, so one number that I throw around quite often is approximately 70% of intrusions that happen to affect OT happen from the IT environment. So I'll bring the example of Colonial Pipeline. It was an IT breach. It happened to be involving things and themes such as poor governance on tracking user accounts and such. And so the IT environment was compromised and the hallmark of that incident was that nobody could speak confidently to whether or not the OT environment was actually a part of the breach. And so in air of caution, Colonial made the right decision. They shut down their pipelines because, you know, attention paid to human safety. Um, the other one that I'll draw at everybody's attention is the um, example of Norse Kedro. And so for perspective, there's a very large furniture company in the world and we all have some of their, their stuff. They use 1% of the wood in the entire world. When Norse Kedro was affected, it affected four, it resulted in a price spike by 4% of the entire aluminum supply in the world. What does Norse Kedro do? They produce aluminum. They happen to own some very, very large subsidiaries um, in North America and worldwide. But one of the things that I want to draw it to your attention is that when they were affected, and I'll be very brief about this, um, excellent public communication, almost no blowback, they were able to sustain 80% of their production because they had all of the controls in place that, okay, this is not, it, it isn't a minor issue, but we're still able to add a third shift, keep moving on, communicate clearly to our clients. And I just want to, I'll hammer that point before we move on to the next slide. And that was that they had a plan. They had a plan to execute on incident management uh, if an incident occurred. So they were, they had prepared for that and they actually executed very well. And so to Hussein's point, they got a lot of accolades in the community because of their transparency and the discussion of what was going on. And that was because they could actually have that transparency because they were doing such a good job. Uh, so again, talking about the, the consequences. So we talked about the impact, uh, but but talking about the consequences. Will we have to throw an entire product line away? Did the was the attacker able to actually get malware onto the product that a victim organization would then ship to their customers? Product recalls are some of the most outrageously expensive things that organizations actually go through. Can they actually change the logic? So maybe they actually get their they not not just do they get control of the device, but they actually are going to use that once it is delivered to a customer. So we're talking at this point, is the victim, the current victim, part of a supply chain attack against a, another victim? Uh, the Oldsmar attack was a good example of this, where they tried to have an impact on the quality of water at the Oldsmar water treatment facility. Uh, I, will, I always caveat this. I, I also teach, and one of the, the teaching moments I have with this is there were other downstream controls that would have prevented contaminated water from entering the actual supply. But even the, the actual attempt to uh, contaminate the water wouldn't work because the person didn't fully understand the control systems they were using. And they put in absurd values that just would not actually work in the first place. But we talk about the loss of, you know, the, the risk to humans. So we're talking about things like losing limbs, losing lives, we're talking about the long-term health, uh, chemical exposure for hazardous substances. These are all things that the site facility and safety officer is going to train the people on for what to do in case of a fire, what to do in case of a spill. Well, we have the potential that there can be a cyber attack that causes that same consequence. So that's one of the things that we want to, if a particular valve failing causes a spill, is there a way for an attacker to cause that to happen intentionally as part of their, their actions on objectives. Now, that's speculation because we don't actually have any known cyber attack that actually led to that. 
But it's one of those things where when you when we actually sit down and we start looking at the risks, we can clearly identify that well, we know that valve is the thing is the is the weak spot. If that valve uh, is opened, it's going to spill. And we have digital controls on that valve that are accessed or they're not accessed. They are uh, wired up to a control room. And if I am an attacker can get in the control room, what level of control can I execute on that valve? Again, so it's not something we've seen, but it's absolutely something that we can see the, the path for an attacker to come in and do that. So that's why we, we look at the consequences. And uh, one of the, I'll give you the mic in just a second, Hussein, but my favorite case of all is Marucci uh, because it really, it, was, it, it combines insider threat with environmental damage and intentional loss of control of systems where the actor just took over the systems, opened up the valves and just dumped a bunch of sewage into the waterways and Marucci Shire. Uh, it's an Australian case. And the uh, result was environmental damage, fish kill. Uh, downstream cities had to do extra processing on the water because they intake their water for their water treatment facilities. So those are all the types of things that we are paying attention to from a consequence perspective. And a lot of times, some of the consequences that we see are not things that we've seen caused by a cyber attack. But once we see the consequence, we are like, well, could a cyber attack do that? Not ambulance chasing. It's a realistic risk risk assessment. Yeah, exactly. And it is all about <clears throat> consequence based events. Um, for example, a lot of safety systems are designed to fail closed. When you close a circuit, it generally stops a reaction. Um, but a threat actor may find themselves in that um, process controller and choose to fail it open, in which case you'd have a higher amount of oxygen in, say, something related to um, a refinery. And that would lead in quite a large blast, multiple, you know, impacts to human life and such. Um, and this is something that happens, unfortunately, on an exceedingly large scale. Now, the issue is that most of it is human error, but that doesn't deprive a threat group from reproducing the results of that said error. So where does this lead me to, lead us to? That leads us to talking about incident management. There has to be a plan for how we are going to actually respond when the, the time comes from it. So a lot of incident management comes from the old uh, large scale forest firefighting of the 1950s. It's uh, known in, at, by, in the United States, it's known as the National Incident Management System. Uh, colloquially, it's still known as the Incident Command System or ICS, or uh, in my realm, because I do OT security, it's known as the other ICS. Uh, but it really is about making sure that you have a plan for having the capability of doing incident response. So you've identified the human resources, you've identified the training, you've identified the equipment necessary. You've even identified uh, the design of your systems which will enable you to do incident response better. We often talk about having defensible architecture in the digital world, and it's the same type of thing. Knowing that we can put uh, blocks in place, we can do network segmentation, we can actually have an intrusion pre prevention system in a certain location to scale down the place we actually need to respond to or allow us to contain and get down to that level of response. So incident management is just that critical idea of having a plan that you can execute on when an incident occurs so that people start to understand their roles. They already have the training, they know where the equipment is, and they actually have the control over the environment to such that they can rapidly respond, contain, and get you back into full production. So yeah. the, go okay. ahead. Uh, so one final point just to drive it home, everything has to be um, documented, defined, and reproducible. It has to be scripted in a way that you can hand it over to a subordinate or another party because you might be on vacation, but it has to happen in exactly the same fashion. And so, Vern, if you want to take um, firing component, and then I can talk about the incident response part of things. Yeah, so so in each one of these, we, we want to talk about the facilities, the equipment, the personnel, the procedures, and the communications. Uh, and, and you'll notice that documentation is missing there because documentation is throughout. Uh, and to Hussein's earlier point, I actually have an entire presentation I give my students, which is the three Ds of incident response, documentation, documentation, documentation. Uh, so it's the that same type of vibe. The We want to have the ability, 
uh, from a facilities perspective uh, to be able to have a central point. Where is command authority coming from? What are the equipment we're going to need ahead? And I love using fire as an example because it, it's a real world analogy that people can, can really grasp. And then we talk about doing this in a, a technical world. So having the facilities, you know, have, or having the equipment, fire extinguishers, fire blankets, risers, same thing. Who's, who are your fire crews? Um, what are the procedures? What, what's the criteria for when do you actually evacuate? Where, where do you go at, in a crisis when something unexpected has happened? And then you talk about communications and, and talking about the components. Uh, we talk, what do we need? What to, you know, I, I have the control center, yeah. But do I also need a place to do a wash station? Well, and I know that I'm playing into Hussein's part, but the forensics lab, I, I love building forensics lab. I'm a, I'm a huge geek. Um, and this actually works in, in both sides, PPEs, uh, personal protection equipment, because I do a lot of on-site incident response as well, which means I have composite toed shoes, I have cotton clothes, hard hat, glasses. Uh, some places actually require me to get training. I know about three points of contact. All of that is the type of stuff from a personnel perspective as and personnel is also training and knowing what I'm going to have to do. What are the procedures? What are even to my reporting requirements? So I, I'm going to hit those first two columns and leave the, the third one for Hussein. But I really want to emphasize that we are building out a bunch of abstracts. And as we talk about incident command and incident management uh, as we go, building out controllable abstracts so that one person you know, might have 400 personnel working under them at 30 different sites. That person can understand and see the entire thing, but they're not gonna be able to give actual commands down at the field level to exactly what needs to be done. So that type of command and authority needs to devolve or break down into those abstracts is why we build out all these abstracts. Thanks, Ron. Uh, <clears throat> so just one point to re-echo. Uh, when you delineate between IT and OTIR, there's a lot of components that are unique. Um, so, for example, when we start to talk about, you know, the training, the PPE, et cetera, you might be responding to an incident that might be next to a military installation. And so specialized training is required. So going to the incident response side of things, it's... Um, it's multi-tiered. So as far as the facilities are concerned, your help desk has to be trained correctly on how to respond to an OT incident because they may not necessarily have the requisite experience in order to realize what the impact actually is. Downstream of that, your security operations center need to be able to triage specific OT incidents. So for example, if they start to see um, something that's a marked departure from the norm. So for example, you have a system that is being interrogated in a way that's unusual, whereas in an IT environment, it might be normal because of monitoring. Obviously, forensics labs are really important because one thing that always, it's my opinion, my opinion only, when we, when we tend to look at cyber incidents in general, it's usually viewed from the viewpoint of availability. I'm ex law enforcement. I view it from the viewpoint and prism of it's a crime. And so having proper chain of custody, rules of evidence, and forensic procedures in place um, tend to be important, especially in the OT environment, because of their regulatory, you know, concerns to be taken into account. Um, in the service of that, your technology stack has to be appropriate. You have to have the proper controls and compensating controls in the environment, such as security tools. Heaven forbid, if an incident actually transpires, having things that are appropriate, such as write blockers, evidence banks, and the like. And most OT environments tend to not employ endpoint agents. It generally is um, taken from the viewpoint of monitoring as passive. And so host-based acquisitions are typical in an OT environment versus in an IT environment. You could do collections using agents and, and, and such. But most importantly, aside from having your technology stack in place, having the right people to make the right decisions in order to trigger a response is of the utmost importance. Train your analysts correctly. Make sure you have your specialists properly trained and make sure that their training is specific to OT. 
um, IT security is really important too, don't get me wrong, but there are certain things which you have to have a very specialized skill set for. Um, and finally, just making sure that your incident response plan and your business continuity and by extension your disaster recovery correctly reflects operational technology and specifically how to report an event, how to tell employees, press releases and such. Um, there was an incident that I've encountered where somebody sent out a social media post. Oh, okay, I'm going home for the rest of the day because there is a major incident in my plant. And of course, it was entirely innocent, um, except for a picture that went on social media of a smoldering building. It completely circumvented communications and it then turned into an unscripted event. And of course, that was an issue. I'm just going to hand it to you. And I can't hit hard enough on the, the planning part down under the procedures uh, because we have, and that really leads into where we're headed with this. We are by design have business continuity plan and disaster recovery plans that are inclusive of things that are not cyber related. They include things like hurricanes and tornadoes and fires and, and all the other things that can actually disrupt our operations that we have planned for. And we are just dovetailing into these with the, hey, what if cyber was the actual cause? How could it? And again, we're not fabricating anything. We are looking at this as a solid risk assessment of what are the consequences? How could an act, uh, actor do this if they had that intent? And then moving in. So planning really, really hits up uh, to that forefront of knowing what you're in a calmer state when you're not in a crisis, designing out what you what you want to do, what your goals are, and how you're going to get to those goals. And that really gets to our convergence of incident response and incident management. So we talk in IT incident response, we don't typically have a evacuation of a building. We don't have a spill. We don't have to worry about PPEs or have medical staff showing up. In incident management, we oftentimes have that. If we have a fire, we have a hurricane or those types of things are happening, we oftentimes are managing that incident as a very physical thing. And the OT incident response kind of dovetails those two realms because while we have to do things like digital collection, we have to do incident response, understanding root cause, we also have to be paying attention to, and our primary focus has to be on human safety, environmental safety, and the dramatic impact on production that we can, you know, for a loss of production capacity that we can have as a result of an incident. Again, we have all these calculations built out for things like fires and floods and hurricanes, and we are introducing or, or really emphasizing the component of there are going to be other causes and we are already seeing actors take action that could have these consequences. So we want to be prepared for them. Yeah, and this pretty much, you know, is reminiscent of, you have to do the calculus in order to, because I can, I can predict downtime in an IT environment. We're losing X amount of dollars versus X amount of seconds. When you start to look at OT, then you have to also take into account um, impact to safety, regulatory fines and sanctions, um, and all of those other dimensions that you really wouldn't come across if, say, a server went down. Uh, anyways. So I hit on the last part on the abstract of incident command. It is very important. And I, I so I have uh, incident command training from FEMA, a uh, couple of different levels, and I know how to do joint incident command. It's a thing where you have more than one incident commander. Uh, typically, that involves something like you might have a fire and something else going on. So you have an incident commander in charge of the fire, an incident command in charge of this other thing. It still typically has somebody above that that is the ultimate authority, uh, making sure that all of that, that works together. So the idea is that with a well-trained incident commander, they can actually do all of the things necessary to build out action plans. What are we going to do? What resources do we have available? What are the priorities that we actually have to, to put in place? But again, an incident commander, uh, if you have a forest fire, the incident commander isn't gonna be telling you to put out a certain grove of trees. The incident commander is going to be allocating resources based upon the perceived threats, the perceived risks, and the available resources. They have a couple of helpers. Uh, the public information officer is the ones that is going to be taking the information from the team and presenting that to the public. In corporations, sometimes that can even be shareholders. Uh, that can even be the internal employees. 
So it's making sure that the communications are consistent with what's going on. But to Hussein's earlier point, it doesn't disrupt our ability to do incident response because it isn't introducing chaos into the story where it's not that we want to control the story or control a narrative from a perspective of lying or being deceitful. We don't want other pressures to come in. We want to be able to set our priorities based upon our, our internal prior to crisis decision making and not be having to put out other little crises that come up because we didn't have a good communication plan. Uh, I still think that one of the most important, one of the, I, I, from a geek perspective, the document perspective, I always say the scribe, there's a person that's designed to do the scribing of all this and write down all the actions that are taken is the most important, but reality, it's the safety officer. The safety officer is really the one person on the team that can stop an action without, has the full authority to just say, that's not safe. We can't do that. Completely, completely contravening the incident commander's order. Anybody can stop an unsafe thing. Don't get me wrong. It's not that somebody down on the ground can't be like, I'm not doing this thing because it's unsafe. But when you're actually putting the action plans together, the safety officer is the one that's focused entirely upon the safety of the operators that are going in to do the response, the people that, that live and work in that environment, the environment itself. That's what the safety, safety officer is focused on. And then we have a couple of abstracts here. I said we have four, but this is not an all inclusive. It's just kind of trying to demonstrate that we have these abstracts built out where I have an operations. So that operations section chief, they're going to be the one that are actually running operations. I'm going to give them an action plan that says, I want you to go do, I want you to go do these things. The operations section chief is going to have the expertise in operations. That could be evidence collection. That could be forensic analysis, you know, in the, in the digital world. Uh, the finance section chief, sometimes these things cost lots of money. Um, we might need to get outside counsel. We might need to get uh, outside agency to actually do some forensics for us. We might even have to spin up some servers and buy some equipment to be able to do the stuff that we need to do. So I, we will have somebody in charge of finance. Logistics, I, I, I half joke, but this is, I was logistics section chief on a couple of different incidents. My biggest thing was finding food for people because we were keeping people 12 to 20 hours. And then also the logistics officer is the one that's going to be rotating people in and out making sure that we have fresh people coming in and we can get the fatigue people off. And then the planning section chief, and they work with the, the, you know, that's kind of counterpart to the operations. The planning is the one that works with the incident commander to, to write the action plan. And then that's delivered to the operations section chief for actually execution on that action plan. So these abstracts are just ways. And, and the really, I say, neat thing about the incident command system is if there's only one person, you're everything. And then you can start to assign roles and it can very quickly expand and contract based upon what we actually need it to be. So we can add more people to it and increase the granularity of each function, or we can contract it when those that level of granularity is no longer needed. Yep, fully agreed. It scales really, really well. Um, let's move on to the next section, yep. um, which is incident data collection. So Collecting evidence from OT networks is a little bit more complicated than IT. Um, it happens to be because we're dealing with legacy systems. Some of those systems are running processes that um, follow the order of volatility, where if we happen to, for example, power something off, our evidence is gone. So in the service of that, it's always important to look at your crown jewels and identify exactly what your high value assets happen to be. What also needs to stem from collecting specifically is assess the data and their retention time. Is there a really short buffer and my evidence is prone to a circular rewrite versus great, I have a year's worth of logs. And of course, most importantly, is that because it's OT, you might be running in a, in, in a network that's segmented or not available for remote access. And so you may have to find yourself equipping yourself with collection methods that are specific to the logic controller that you're looking at, or perhaps an exotic cable of some sort. Uh, so in any event, preparation is key. Make sure that you have procedures that are validated. Make sure that you have the necessary components of your toolkit, because it's quite uncomfortable to arrive on site and realize that you forgot a cable or even have a plan. 
Uh, I'm yeah. saying I couldn't. I, there's really nothing to add other than the fact that I just reemphasizing the fact that all of this is planning. All of this is being prepared for the incident ahead of time and then executing on that plan. So as we start talking about methods of collection, and again, we have some issues with collection in OT environments because of legacy equipment, because of proprietary equipment, uh, you know, and then it becomes a value question of do I, how much uh, collection effort do I want to put forward to be able to collect from that particular thing? So a lot of the like, collection tools that we have off the shelf for incident response these days will run on Windows 7. Well, I have a Windows 2000 system, or I have a, you know, Again, I've seen Windows 98 within the last two years. Um, will the tool run on that? How would we do collection off of that? So having a collection management framework allows us to identify what information we have available in the environment, where it is, how we would access it, and what its re retention is for. That's really what the collection management framework is designed to do. It is an inventory and access list for all of the information in an in environment. It's great for incident responders, side sale. It's also great for the detection team because once they know what information is available, they can actually work their detection strategy. We're not covering that today, but I can't talk about collection management framework without telling you about both great parts of it. Yeah, and just to echo Vern's point, as an IR fellow, first thing I do when I get on site, okay, what logs do you have for me? Which brings us kind of into the different kinds and flavors of data sets. So we have you know, network logs. And those are the more transient kind of logs that um, we at Dragos value because we have um, controls in the environment such as platform, for example. And what that does is it passively does network introspection and tends to hunt for ICS protocols. It will track things like NetFlow. When we start to look at the process side of things, that's where the CMF really shines because we actually identify the specificity of the logs that exist in the environment and how long they exist for, and then multiply that by level of difficulty to harvest it. In the service of the order of volatility, network and memory reign supreme. So for example, I may mention of, you may turn something off and you may lose your evidence. So things like workstation memory, server memory, device, um, going on to the less volatile things, um, page file, hybrid file. So identifying all of those sort of things um, is really key. And of course, when you start to look at um, HMIs, servers, desktops and such, Windows event logs, are we logging PowerShell? How much of the application logging is actually turned on from the start? A lot of the log entries specifically for Windows, um, they're turned off by default because they're simply too noisy. But from Vern and I, from our perspective, um, those are extremely important. And so having all of those artifacts uh, readily available empower folks like Vern and I to respond to an incident. And the one thing I want to highlight on this is there is one of these quadrants that's just got one different characteristic than the other three. And that is, if you are not already collecting network information, we are never going to have that because those packets are gone. I can go back into the process logs and see what happened in the process logs. I can go into grab host memory and I can do an analysis of the host memory. If it's been rebooted, not really useful, but the host information, the disk forensics, again, that's all historical stuff. But, but all of the network data is typically transient unless you are actually having a plan to do some type of telemetry collection. And that leads us right into the, the network collection of having a plan for being able to build out uh, what, what do your net flows look like? What firewall logs are worth collecting? I remember in the original days of SIMS where you actually had to pay per things that you indexed uh, in that model, you, know, you could get very expensive if you wanted to uh, index every single one of your firewall permits. Uh, what, do you act, what are the actual things that you're, you're going to, to log? But these data sets from a NetFlow perspective, you know, what, what, who's talking to who over what protocol for how much? We're not talking about PCAP. We're not talking about full packet capture type systems. We're just talking about systems that give us metadata about what was going on, record that, and then allow the incident response team, when we come in, oh, something's happened. Or, well, I see an RDP connection, remote desktop protocol connection between host A and host B. Uh, is this, yeah, and then I can start drilling in. Well, who, what, what credentials were used for this? 
the network telemetry is what is going to lead me to host A and host B as the targets for further research. And if I haven't pre if I haven't collected or planned for collecting that telemetry, I'm not going to have those leads to know where else to look. And one of the, the hallmarks of the way we do our network collection, our network visibility is passive. One of the other tricks we have in the OT environment is there's a lot of timing loops in place in these environments that are very tight. And if the timing is off on network packets arriving or being processed by a system, that can actually disrupt production because the process itself is being disrupted. And there are some devices that are just fragile. If you just do an HTTP scan on the system, it's going to crash. Uh, it, yeah, that device is going to fail. So we are very hesitant to do any type of active scanning in an environment by default. It's possible if you've done the proper resiliency, but our, our methodology is passive put a tap on the line and just collect telemetry about what's going on. It is therefore, again, available for your detection team to build out detection capability. But from that incident response perspective, it's going to give us the leads of where to start doing the forensics investigation on hosts. It really is the thing that, that focuses in on hosts. Yeah, and you know that kind of brings us to the whole passive introspection and consequently platform, it is passive. Uh, and of course, it's always useful as an incident transpires. However, Vernon and I both prefer if it would be in place before the fact, because that gives us our historical log. But the main thing, and Vern brought up very well, in terms of OT devices are fragile. And one of my practices is in, in an OT environment, I will put in a honeypot that alarms when it gets pinged because that is a sign of a threat group in the environment. Consequently, platform kind of looks at those sort of different pieces of traffic and produces what's called a baseline. And it monitors for what I call a marked departure from the norm. It will sit there and it will learn the environment and it will use passive introspection via spam ports or network taps in order to understand what the lay of the land is. And then it starts to identify things that are just a little bit off, a little bit strange. And we, we've designed the Dragos platform to be more than just something that records the actions that are going on in the network. We It has the ability to detect things that fall out of that baseline. It has the ability to detect things that we just know are bad. And then we're able to use it during incident response as that historical record of what was transpiring on the network. Uh, to the point where we can see, again, which hosts we're talking, which protocols, what times. And if it's a plain text protocol, we can even dissect that plain text protocol and get inside and see, well, what was the command issue? That was a PLC stop command. We can actually see that level of actions on the network and have those recorded. So when I now go, and we'll talk about it in just a second, when I get to the process uh, archives or the process log, and I see, well, I see this, the RPMs doubled right here. I can see it in the process log. Data historian says pressure spiked here or RPMs went up here. I can now go back into the network data and I can look to see if I can see that command going across the wire so I can see what host issued the command. Those are the types of things that having that level of visibility on the traffic in your OT environment, being able to dissect OT protocols and actually characterize systems based upon what they're doing and record some of those things that are going across in plain text, really help us as incident responders be able to answer the question of what happened, how did it happen, how do we prevent it from happening again and getting down to root cause. So when we start talking about uh, host disk collection, it's one of those things where when I, when I first moved to IT incident response from law enforcement, we didn't do a lot of disk collection because it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, and the value was more in memory for protecting large corporations, banks, defense contractors, those types of things. Uh, but now that I've got, you know, moved back into OT over the last 13 years, it's a, it's a case of the disk collection is still a really good source of record. And oftentimes the systems we can't collect memory from them because they just don't, we don't have the right tools. They're an old system, they're fragile, something else. But I can always uh, do that, that disk collection. So off of that disk, particularly the Windows system, but I've done forensics on Linux systems, uh, the couple of custom systems. The disk image is really going to help us build out the timeline. It's going to have all of the artifacts. And as much as adversaries want to try to time stomp things and damage the data, they never get it all. 
there's always, and I'm going to knock on wood, but it's always something that uh, left behind for me to at least tease, tease a trail out on. Um, and to who saying said something earlier about the, you know, uh, chain of custody. I love to do chain of custody, but I will not let chain of custody get in the way of me doing speed of answer because in the business realm, we are typically not going to court with an incident. Incident response is not to develop evidence so that we can take somebody to court and put somebody in jail. It is to give business leaders the best answer possible as fast as possible so they can make the best business decision. And that really is a driving focus that diverges from law enforcement civil litigation type of evidence collection versus what we're actually doing here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a priority on getting answers in particular when regulatory affairs are at play or data privacy. Um, but more importantly, you know, threat groups in general have kind of evolved. And that kind of brings us to the next slide, which happens to cover things that are on a more volatile basis. So for if you will. Awesome. So <clears throat> memory, um, threat groups are better. They are faster, they're smarter. Um, there is self-defending malware, there's stuff that runs resident in memory. And there's a particularly notable incident that I encountered where the insider threat did everything and made sure to keep everything volatile. And so for four days I struggled and I couldn't find answers until I started to look at um, memory samples and then it just pretty much unfolded because what we have to be aware of is that threat groups are constantly evolving their techniques tactics procedures and such and so host-based forensics is great from a law enforcement legal viewpoint but from the viewpoint of actually encountering for example of an advanced threat group uh, they may choose to do everything in memory but here's the issue with memory. We have legacy systems in an OT environment. You may not be able to actually get an image or you may tax the resource to the point where it becomes volatile or there's a critical process that happens to be running on the host. And so when it comes to memory acquisition, always test before you need it because you might trigger a blue screen when you do your memory dump or you may not have the correct interfaces in place. All of those considerations need to be taken into account before an incident happens rather than during. And this is actually when we run tabletop exercises, I will oftentimes offer the option to actually have them test their memory collection capability because it really does come down to it is something that lots of organizations assume they can do. But much like restoring from backup, I never I'm never confident that somebody can collect memory until I've actually seen them collect memory. And then the, the last part gets us to the host or the process data collection. And this is a really fundamental difference in the OT environment from a what, what is available to the incident responder. Because in, an, in a production environment, these, there is tracking of the entire process. There's sequence of events logging. There is a data historian. And these are things that, uh, like uh, the best way to describe this is the uh, programmable logic circuit, the PLC it can tell you really good answers about what its current state is. But if you ask it about what it was like five minutes ago, it doesn't have that. The PLC is a, it is an in the moment type of device. It doesn't keep a record of what its prior state was, but it does report out to a data historian or the sequence of event uh, tracker is tracking the changes to the state in the process. And we as incident responders can go back and be, go look for changes. Well, I actually saw that the pressure valve blew at 9.03, according to the actual people in the field. But I can go back and say, well, that's when the pressure spike, that it reached that level, but when did it start to rise? Oh, I, and there's a pressure, maybe there's a pressure measurement every minute or every five minutes. And I can actually see that pressure buildup. I can, so what caused the pressure buildup? I can see the RPMs on a pump change, or I can see a valve close that's supposed to stay open. Those are the types of things that your process data allows you to uh, from a, what is the timeline of things that happened? If I know that a valve closed 10 minutes before the actual incident occurred, what systems control the valve? I can now go back and look at my network telemetry. What systems were communicating with the control system that controls the valve? I have a lead to go back and look. So process data is vital in a production environment, oftentimes to give us that moment in time, that time slice for where we want to go look at our other systems. 
All right, on to the next. So let's talk about the OTIR process. It's slightly different from the MITRE TECH framework because we also happen to take into account um, OT considerations. But it, it pretty much follows, we prepare, we identify, we contain, eradicate, recover, and then, hey, what did we learn out of this? So at the core of it, it is the classical incident response workflow, but with OT differences. So when it comes to the roles and duties of OT operators, we typically tend to assign, contain, eradicate, recover. Why? They know the environment the best. And if we come into an environment that we're unaware of, and I've had this happen a couple of times, you take into events, facts, et cetera, as best you can, but really it's somebody that knows the lay of the land that's the most, um, most valuable. We call them plant champions. Uh, but most importantly is the continuous flow of containment and eradication because what you're doing is approaching it from the viewpoint of, I don't trust this network until I am confident that all of the IOCs have been evacuated from said network. I call them eviction days. Right? And if you'll notice, uh, we'll talk about the, the abbreviation here, but the prepare, identify, contain, eradicate, recover, and lessons learned, there can be some fights about how to pronounce this abbreviation, but we, we refer to that as, or I refer to it as pickerel, I've heard other people use uh, other pronunciations, but it really is that design for building out your incident response plan for having the plan. And then each one of those is a headline in your incident response plan where you call out the, this is my goal. These are the people that are responsible for doing this. And this is the end. This is where I, where I want them to get to. This is the objective of that particular section. It really is uh, important to understand who owns particular processes not just inside the facility, but also inside that incident response plan, because you want your incident response plan. If the incident response plan says that a certain team has a responsibility, they shouldn't learn about that at the beginning of a crisis that they're named in the incident response plan. They should be part of that de design and build. So inside of the incident response plan, with those abstracts in place, we put all the workflow diagrams. Uh, appendices is usually where I put contact data, unless it's a team. If there's a team email, maybe that could go in the incident response plan. But if you're putting uh, individual phone numbers, individual emails, I usually try to keep all that into appendices so that it doesn't get stale quickly and it's easier to change in the, the overall IRP. But we're gonna have more details about Pickerel in the next webinar. So let's go and uh, summarize what we've covered today. We, we really wanna talk about the impact or we really hope that you, you learned about the impact to OT systems, it's different. It can be safety concerns, it can be environmental issues, and it can have a huge impact on the bottom line because of production disruptions. Uh, we are doing OT incident response, usually in conjunction with incident management. So there could be a larger incident environment. We have to take into account those types of things. And Hussein, I'll let you cover three and four. Very good. Uh, data collection, it is specialized. It is extremely um, important that it's done correctly given the consideration for safety systems. But at the end of the day, the thing that enables OT incident responders like Vern and I, we need network visibility. Um, a lot of the tools that we would typically use during an IT incident just simply are not applicable to the OT environment, which is why planning is really important. All right, so we thank you for attending today's webinar our individual emails that you can contact us at Dragos at are here. Uh, and we're going to move into a question and answer phase. So Hussein, you and I, we're gonna to need to go take a look at the questions that have been posted and yep. put some answers together.